and all of a sudden you've got a dinner plate giant dahlia. So it's kind of like a mystery. Um, it's exciting to watch them grow. And Welcome to The Art of Gardening. I'm your host, Melissa Lalo Johnson. And today in our efforts to help those that are trying to start a farm and learning all about it, we have very special guests from Home Place Fields, Tim and Lynn Windemeyer. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having us. So where, tell us about yourselves. Where are you guys located? We are just east of St. Joseph, Missouri on Tim's maternal grandfather's home place. So the farm that his family founded in 1868. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. So what types of, how many acres are you guys on? So the farm that we are currently on is about an eight acre piece right around the original um, homestead. Um, it's kind of part of the name of the business that we came up with. My whole family, um, even extended family, has always referred to our farm as the home place. And so when we were establishing the flower farm, it made a lot of sense that since everybody called it the home place already, that we just uh, kind of bridged over to call it home place fields. That's awesome. And how long ago did you guys decide to take the leap and, and do the farming? Or has this always been the path? This was, um, well, this is our seventh season uh, doing the flower farm. So in 2016, um, September, we moved in and got the kids in school and all that good stuff and then started our grand experiment of 2017 in January, starting seeds. That's great. And tell us about your first couple of seasons. How was it? How did, how did you, what was the process? Well, I, I would say probably for the first three or four seasons, we called it a grand experiment because <laughs> we didn't know if we could grow it. We didn't know if we did grow it if we could market it, if the community would be interested in locally grown fresh cut flowers. Um, and so when we moved back to the farm after being overseas and, and out of state for a number of years, uh, we were coming back into a farming operation with my family and we've got the traditional corn, the traditional soybeans, the cows. Um, but Lynn and I really felt strongly that we wanted to do something a little different with the farm here. And so we started looking through all the different things that, that we could do and, and kind of prioritizing the things that that we wanted to um, invest in in our farm. And that was including, you know, having the community be part of it, um, expressing, you know, openness that people could come out and be part and participate in the farm with us um, and see um, kind of the beauty of flowers being grown. Um, so the first couple of years, I think we started off very small and we incrementally grew in and the size of the fields that we were growing and the different types of flowers. We've typically taken maybe five to 10 new varieties every year or tried different things with them. I've got notebooks that I just keep all kinds of notes on of when I fail and never do that again. And well, that kind of works. So let's try tweaking that a little bit more. So it definitely has been a very iterative process for us to learn how to grow a lot of different varieties of flowers. So take us through when you guys got set up and you're ready to start doing that first, you did some seed starting, were you buying any plugs and what, how did you make the first selections of what you were going to plant? Well, the first year, I think we kind of just started with things that seemed simple, <laughs> you know, seed starting um, and then also direct sowing. The very first resource we used was the flower farmer by Lynn. I really am going to butcher her last name, Benzikin. Um, someone gifted that to us before we left North Carolina. So we were kind of we were really studying her book and just using her recommendations. And then we also had a small book from um, Lisa, the cool flowers farmer, <laughs> and we used her book too. So those were our first two go-tos and then kind of digging into Florette a little bit more online and, and how she was doing certain things. Um, that was, that's where we started. Just things we thought we knew. We I love do. that. Yeah. <laughs> That's great because so many people, I feel like they get very intimidated. They feel yeah. like you have to have some great expertise or you have to have, you know, some knowledge of doing this. And I love that you guys just went to kind of the, you know, known flower people for what they're doing. They had great, they do have great books. I mean, I love, I love all of those books. And so being able to like read and just kind of absorb the information and then do it the way that you, you know, the way that your path yeah. is telling you to yeah. do it. So 
when you first started, so you grew that first year, how did you bring your flowers to market? Where did you take them? How did you start that adventure? Well, we were, I remember very distinctly standing in the middle of the field. I don't know if it was quite July yet, but it felt like late June, early July. And we had just had a baby, our fourth child in April. So I was constantly wearing him and we were, I was standing in the field and I was like, okay, we have some flowers. Now what What are we going to do with them? So I just started um, gifting little bouquets of flowers to different businesses. I started with some of the local grocery stores and then um, some of the local florists thinking we would do wholesale. That's what a lot of people did. We knew we didn't want to do farmer's market. We just felt like for our family, that wasn't going to work with little kids and um, just being committed to sitting there every weekend didn't seem like the lifestyle that we could handle. So we focused on wholesale at first. And then I had heard about a little boutique um, in downtown St. Joseph. And because I had just had a baby, I hadn't even had a chance to go there yet. But I had talked to some other um, people who had shopped there and they just kept raving about it. And so I thought, I'm just going to email her and see. And so I emailed her um, and said, hey, I don't know if I could just bring you a sample bouquet and if maybe you would be interested in selling bouquets from your shop. Um, we just started growing, you know, just east of you. And I think it would maybe be a good partnership. So she was all about it. And I, I met with her, I think the next day. And um, she actually posted that sample bouquet um, and sold it before the end of the day and then ordered more for that weekend. And we just started a, a really long partnership with um, with that shop. So Nesting Goods is the shop and they've just been a great partnership for us. That's wonderful. So from there, I saw that you're also now evolved into a subscription service as well. Is that correct? Yeah, that was definitely so inspiration. Through, how did that happen? So we, we took, after our first year of growing, we took over the winter, the first online course that Flora offered. And so we were an alumni of her first online course. And um, she really kind of laid out how to do a subscription. So we just went for it and set it up. And it took a little bit of educating the community on what that would look like. But um, that ended up just, I think the first year of subscriptions paid for what we had to pay to take that course. So it was worth every penny. So you set up a, an online website and mm -hmm. then you're doing your marketing through social media, I'm assuming. And I mean, I see it. I love your I love your social media, which by the way, um, we will give this information at the end too. But um, if you're interested in learning more about what we're talking about right now, mm -hmm. um, it's Home Place Fields on Instagram. Are you guys also on Facebook yes. and all the things? Yes. Okay. Home, and website? And Facebook, yeah. And the okay. website. And then your is website, is it Home Place Fields? Yes. What's Home the address Fields. for the website? Homeplacefields.com. Okay, perfect. So this is the place that you can go to get a subscription service. Now, is your subscription service local only or are you also shipping? So we are currently local um, for pickup. And that is a six and 12 week subscription that we've been doing since that second season. Um, we have pickup locations around St. Joe and one in Savannah. And here at the farm or nesting goods are, are the options here in St. Joe. So we do that and it starts every mid-June and goes through the beginning of September. But we did just start a, we're doing an experiment this year with our Route 36 subscription. And that is kind of the dream of um, being able to share our flowers all, of, all across northern Missouri. Um, and we're ending in my hometown of Hannibal, Missouri. So starting the end of June, we're going to do a six week trial run and see um, how that goes uh, for this season. And if it works out well, um, we hope to expand throughout the next the coming seasons as well. So of all the flowers that you've grown over the last seven years, what have been some of your favorites? I, I kind of laugh thinking about this because they're probably more work than any other flower that we we have but i really enjoy the dahlias i think it's it's the prettiest bloom that we grow um, we don't actually mark all of the dahlia tubers every year we we mark maybe some special varieties um, but i just i 
put everything in a box together. And so it's fun for me to watch, you know, a tuber this big have the tiniest little blooms on it. And then you get a, a tuber that you plant the next year this big, and all of a sudden you've got a dinner plate giant dahlia. So it's kind of like a mystery. Um, it's exciting to watch them grow. And I think the flowers, like just the symmetry in the flowers are, are, are is beautiful to me. I really like the Lysianthus. Um, we tried to grow those from seed when we first started and had a really hard time with those. They just take a, a really long time. And after talking with other more experienced growers, um, we started ordering plugs and they just are pretty low maintenance really for us. Um, they've done well out in the field. They're doing great in our new hoop house and um, they just have the longest vase life. They, they're the ones that every customer asks about. I mean, they get excited about the dahlias too, don't get me wrong, but they always are curious about the lisianthus and, and just talk about how much they enjoy them. Do you have irrigation through the things like the dahlia and all of your flowers, or are there some things that don't need irrigation? It, yeah, we've got most of the beds um, out in the open field are on drip irrigation. Um, I've got it set up in a couple of different systems so I can do different amounts of water for different kinds of flowers. Um, but then we do have some that once we get them started, we just kind of let them rain feed. Um, you know, suns, sunflowers are a great example of that. They're so hardy that once you get them going, um, they're, they're fine to keep running. So mixed, but majority of things are under irrigation. So let's talk a little bit about the pests because I know firsthand, I mean, I'm just 30 minutes away from you guys South, mm -hmm. the, Japanese beetles are terrible here. You know, I have a really bad time with them. How, what kind of pests, and I've also had trouble with thrips, what okay. types of pests have you guys battled and how did you, how did you manage the issue? So two of my least favorite, um, you've already mentioned one, the Japanese beetles can be terrible. Um, and again, when we were first starting out, I thought I was being clever by setting out the Japanese beetle traps. Um, so trying to set those bags out all over the farm, what I found that I was doing was just attracting all kinds more beetles. And so it got to the point where I was dumping a five gallon bucket of Japanese beetles out every other day or so. I mean, they were just everywhere. So I learned in those pests that yes, they are a nuisance, but less interaction with them is actually a little bit more. So when we took the bags down and stopped attracting all of them, it actually got significantly better for us. Um, the other pest that was really kind of a bane and, and continues to be a struggle for some of our flowers, but we've got a lot of moles. Um, and the moles, especially in the early spring, were just wreaking havoc on our tulip beds when we put them out. And you could see just mole runs all through the tulips and it made the flowers come up uneven and it, it just looked real, really sporadic. Um, the way that I've found to deal with them is I actually dig a trench every year and put a metal cage down below the, t the tulips and then refill and put put that cage top to bottom, six inches above the ground. It's all the way along the bottom. Um, so they just literally can't get in. And it's amazing every year when we're digging up tulips and harvest, there are mole runs all the way around the edge of the cage where they've tried all season long to get in, but they just can't do it. So physical barrier was the only way that I got ahead of, of the moles. Yeah, I'll tell you what, we battle them here terrible too, through the lawn, you know, the dogs are digging mm -hmm. huge yeah. holes trying to get them. So it's a huge problem and we've tried everything. I mean, I have every kind of trap they've ever made in my garage <laughs> and they just, they're so smart or I don't know what it is with them, but they just seem to evade the traps and they are very difficult to manage. So, and that's great advice too. I know a couple of years ago, I was out at one of the, um, one of the garden centers and they sell also like, like wire baskets. So if you're going to plant, because one of my issues with planting more like landscaping mm -hmm. is that they'll tunnel around either through or around the outside, they bust all the roots out. Mm -hmm. And then the next season, you know, if it's an evergreen or things like that, they don't come back. Yeah. So they sell these buckets or it's, it's like a bucket size, but, um, of metal, you know, the metal, um, and then that will help too. So if you're planting for, you know, for ornamentals, but yeah, it's definitely, that's great advice. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. What else? Um, have you had any pests that aside from the Japanese beetles, um, have you had anything else, any aphids, any 
spider mites, any anything like that that you've had any kind of serious trouble with? It depends on the season. We have had in the past, um, I've found a lot of like the neem oil kind of treatments will help with some of those things when we've dealt with them. Um, but it's it's very seasonal. Some years we don't seem to have much problem at all. And other years it, it seems much, much heavier. Yeah, I agree. Um, can you tell us, so in all the different um, tools that you've used, and I love to ask this question because I always want to know if there's new tools out there that someone's using that I have not heard of. So any like special tools or anything that's made your just job easier to manage? So this is a simple one that I didn't even know existed, and it's probably been around for 50 years. Is um, Somebody, one of our staff brought out a dandelion tool that's got like the fork to knife at the end. Yeah, that's true. It revolutionized my life. I didn't know it existed. Like, this is amazing. It can get yeah. thistles. It can get all kinds of things. So that that's a very simple one that I'm sure most people know about it. I just didn't. No, yeah, for sure. They're great. I remember. I'll never. I mean, it was probably within the last, you know, eight, nine years. We brought one of those home because we get random sporadic dandelions. Mm -hmm. And it is, it's a life changer. That first one that you do and the whole tap root comes out, the whole carrot. And you're like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. It's like yeah. surgery. Yes, that's definitely a very good one. <laughs> yes, for sure. What kind of pruners do you guys use with all the pruning you have to do and all the cutting? And wh what do you guys recommend? There's one specific kind that we've got that there's probably 10 of them at different places around the farm. And I know we both keep a set of them in our vehicles too, even yeah. because you never know when you're going to need them. The name of it's just- Did you say it has the red handle? Yes. Yeah. It's bright orange and it's and the kind falcos? of- It's kind of Falco? cushy. It's like got a squishy handle. <laughs> Is it Falco? Yes, I think so. That sounds yeah, great. That's what I use too. I love them. <laughs> yeah, they're great. They're great. And if they're I drop great. them, um, I and can I like how to find them. <laughs> yes. And I mean, it's very, I feel like they're very easy maintenance. All these years I've had the same pair and I've only had to replace the inner spring and like mm -hmm. sharpen, you know, order a new set of um, uh, tips once yeah. in all this time. So yeah, they're very dependable. I love yeah. mine too. Um, okay. So what, um, what else, what else is coming up for you guys? What are there, what's in the future for home place fields? So, you know, we talked about the route 36 subscription. I feel like that's a really big leap forward for us. Um, and I would love to see that grow to where we have stops all the way along 36 and we can provide, um, our, Missouri grown blooms all the way across Northern Missouri. So that's a huge one for us. Um, we put up our first hoop this spring and that was a big step forward too. And of course, now we wanna add like three more <laughs> because we love it so much. Um, so as we continue to learn more about using a hoop and farming in a hoop and what what that's all about, um, I think that will, that will definitely be a huge game changer for us. Um, in the, in the seasons ahead. Um, on, on September 9th, we have our flower farm day and it's our third annual one. And um, that's, that's always an exciting um, kind of almost culmination of the season. It's not the very end, but it's pretty close. And it's the time then we get to finally invite like the whole community. And we've had people come from all over um, the Midwest to, to visit during that day and they're shopping and music and, and um, food and, it's just a really fun day that we look forward to. That is so fun. Well, it's very, um, it's been really great meeting you guys and listening to your journey and how, how everything is kind of just, you know, you're following the path and it started mm -hmm. and you've just kind of, I love the, uh, hoop too. So you, this is your first hoop house you guys just put in. Yeah. What, um, what company did you go through for your hoop? So we actually bought a used hoop, um, that, we had to go and take down. It was on the other side of Kansas City. Um, and it's kind of a piecemeal job. Um, it had been up for five or six years at a different farm. Uh, he was using it for vegetable production, but it was the cheapest way for us to start on on hoop production. And again, everything, you know, we, we, we kind of grow it incrementally, you know. So we started um, with a smaller hoop, but it was a complete hoop that had all the electrical and all the exhaust fans and it actually came with a heat source also. So um, it was a complete um, and it was maybe a quarter of the price of what a newer hoop would have been. Um, so we got that up in early spring and got the skin on it, um, I guess in March. 
and we've been growing in it ever since. And I actually, I love it. Oh my word. I love it. It's, it's so nice to yeah. be able to work when it's raining outside and just not be in the rain. The temperature control is amazing. We've had success with flowers that we tried probably four or five different years in a row that didn't have a whole lot of success out in the field that just exploded in growth inside of the hoop. So I feel like it's going to be really big just for a different way to produce, but also in extending our growing season. So I've got, like Lynn said, we've got laid out in our minds where two and three are going to go next because we think it's just going to help in production so much. That's awesome. What do you guys have in the hoop? Um, what did you start that has grown so well for you? So the Crispedia, the, the sun balls, um, we've never grown them as big as they are in, in the hoop. They're, they're just giant. Um, the Godisha got really big. Mm -hmm. I have failed with stock for whatever reason in the field mm -hmm. to the point that I gave up on it. And so this year, just like, well, let's give it a try. We had beautiful giant stock early in the season this year. Um, there's a run of Lysianthus in there. I'm, I'm basically, we're throwing in a bunch of different things and just trying to see what, what will, what will grow. So the snaps are happy in there. We've got eucalyptus in there now, um, dahlias, the ranunculus and anemones. They're all, they all are just happier. It seems inside the protection. How big is that? Is your new hoop? It is uh, 20 by 60. Oh, wow. That's really nice. <laughs> That's exciting, guys. I mean, really exciting. And to think about having two to three more, I mean, that's really going to change a lot because mm -hmm. it's really harsh weather here in uh, in Missouri. So that's for sure. Yeah, I'm forever looking um, at okay, cool. uh, the old skins or the old frames that are on farms around, you know, just, hmm, that used to be in production, but I wonder if they'd be ready to sell <laughs> it now. So yeah, that's brilliant. I mean, that's a great, that's a great idea. A great idea. Well, our friends at Petra Tools are so happy that you guys are with us today. So they wanted to offer you a free gift. So I have three choices for you. Choice number one is worm tea. So this is great for indoor, outdoor plants, adding worm castings, beneficial microbes. Um, it's great. I mean, I love this stuff. I use it everywhere. Okay. Second choice is the organic fish and seaweed fertilizer. This is made from American hydrolyzed fish and kelp. And um, this stuff is just, yeah, I mean, you know the benefits of this. Um, mm -hmm. Just nutrient densely packed with nutrients um, that all plants will love. And it can be used indoors. I've actually tested it to use it indoors. Once it's absorbed by the soil, there's no more smell. So it's <laughs> pretty good stuff. And then I also have uh, the option of a max strength liquid fertilizer. Right now is the time. If your grass is getting a little brown or getting a little stressed, um, you can pop some of this on there and get yourself some, get it to green back up. So guys, what is it going to be? I mean, fish and seaweed all the way. <laughs> yeah. We use that stuff all more that. than anything else. Yeah, it's so good. Yeah. It's so good. So great. We will um, get this out to you and definitely keep us posted on on using it and uh, what you think about it. So um, for, again, we're going to go through how to find out more about Home Place Fields, Lynn and Tim Windmeyer, um, home, at Home Place Fields um, on Instagram and Facebook and homeplacefields.com to be able to visit their website, learn more about their subscription service. And I mean, they have absolutely beautiful, you guys grow, grow beautiful flowers, beautiful arrangements. So it's very nice to meet you. And um, we'll definitely have to keep our Keep our eyes on you guys. Thanks. Keep following along. It's great to meet you too. Yeah. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thanks guys. See you later. Bye.